Yes, Mr Hodge. Commissioner, the next witness is Ms Baglari. Yes. Ms. Baglari, uh, can I ask whether you'd prefer to uh, make an oath or take an affirmation? An affirmation, thank you, Commissioner. Perhaps you could be good enough to stand then, please. I solemnly and sincerely. I solemnly and sincerely. Declare and affirm. Declare and affirm. That the evidence I shall give. That the evidence I shall give. Will be the truth. Will be the truth. The whole truth. The whole truth. And nothing but the truth. And nothing but the truth. Thank you very much. Do sit down. Yes, Mr. Hunt. Thank you, Commissioner. Your name is Dana Baglari? That's correct. And you've provided your address to the Royal Commission? I have. And Ms. Baglari, you've received a summons to attend and give evidence before the Royal Commission? I have. Do you have a copy of the summons there with you? Yes, I do. Commissioner, I tender that summons. Exhibit uh, 3.7 will be the uh, summons to Ms Bagliari. And Ms Bagliari, you've also made a statement to the Commission dated 16 May. I have. Now, do you have any corrections you want to make to that statement other than... I, should, I was going to direct you specifically to something and perhaps I'll do that first. Your statement has been prepared based on your review of your file notes. That's correct. And were there some parts of your statement where you don't, you've had to draw it from your file note rather than any current recollection you have? Is yes, that right? that's right. And can I just clarify what those parts are? If you go to paragraph 16D of your statement, where you record that Ms Flanagan had instructed you that she does not remember signing any documents to become a shareholder of the company, but recalled she was to be silent partner in the business. Do you have a recollection of that conversation or is that something that's drawn from your file note? That paragraph is drawn from my file note. All right. And if I just ask one question then about that, do you, did you make any note about what Ms Flanagan's understanding was of what a silent partner meant? To the best of my recollection in that file note, I recorded that Ms Flanagan understood that she was to be a silent partner, but she said that, that she didn't know exactly what that meant in terms of her role with the business, and she wasn't sure if she'd signed any documents to make that um, happen in effect. All right. And if you go to paragraph 19 of your statement, is there some part of this paragraph that's drawn from your notes rather than your refreshed recollection from your notes? Uh, yes, so this paragraph here is drawn from my file notes um, in terms of the level of detail that, that Legal Aid contacted ASIC and then later contacted Castle Ray Accounting. Um, I didn't make those inquiries myself. It was a paralegal who made those inquiries. Uh, and so that paragraph is drawn from my um, file note uh, discussions with that paralegal after he'd made those inquiries. All right, and your statement also contains very detailed explanations of the dealings that you had and the communications that you had with Foz. And is that a result of being able to refresh your memory from the file notes you took of, uh, in relation to those communications? Yes, that's right. I have a memory of what happened during the FOS dispute resolution process, but the level of detail that I provide in my statement is further to recordings that I make in my file notes um, about the particular 
discussions that were had in the course of that dispute resolution process. Right. Are there any, with that qualification, are there any other parts of, or any corrections that you want to make with respect to your statement? There's one small correction at paragraph 58. In the first line, I repeat in favour twice. I'd like to delete one of those in favours. You choose and delete one. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> and I've initialled it as well. Thank you. And otherwise, is your statement true and correct to the best of your knowledge? Yes. All right. I tend to that statement, Commissioner. Uh, exhibit 3.8, statement of Ms Bagliari, 16 May 18. Now, Ms Baglari, where do you work? I work at Legal Aid New South Wales. Okay. And how long have you been at Legal Aid New South Wales for? Since September 2013. And what's your role at Legal Aid New South Wales? I'm a senior solicitor. Uh, I work in the consumer law specialist team, which sits within the civil law division of Legal Aid New South Wales. And how many solicitors are in that team altogether? In the consumer law team, there's approximately 12 solicitors and in the general civil law division there's around 179 staff members. Right. And the consumer law team deals with what sorts of matters? Where we assist disadvantaged people with their credit and debt, uh, general consumer protection and insurance matters. Um, so we provide casework advice and representation to those people. We also participate in a large amount of law reform and policy discussions um, and manage a number of stakeholder relationships with industry, the ombudsman, regulators. Now, Legal Aid has acted for parents who, provide, who have provided guarantees to, for children's business loans, is that right? That's correct. Apart from this particular case? That's correct. And are you able to make any observations to us as to typically what sort of consumers are providing those types of guarantees? Mm. So in, in our casework experience at Legal Aid, it's generally older people, so older parents, who are using their homes as security for business loans for the benefit of a third party who's usually a son or daughter. And when do they typically come to you? They, they come to, those people come to us for advice at the point where the bank is threatening to sell their home. There's a specialist service within Legal Aid that can deal with some of these types of issues, is that That's right? That's right, yes. So the Mortgage Hardship Service is a service which provides advice and casework assistance to people who are experiencing financial difficulty and who are at risk of uh, losing their home. And you have personally provided, apart from Ms Flanagan, you've provided assistance to older people in this sort of circumstance? Yes, that's correct. And what sort of issues have you observed in relation to the provision of advice to older people who've provided guarantees for their children? Mm. There's a number of issues that I've, I've observed um, in my own casework practice and from discussing my colleagues' casework with them. Um, firstly, it's that um, people often want to put family first. They consider that family is paramount uh, or they might feel some pressure to do what their child asks them to do in order to preserve the relationship. And so in those circumstances, my clients might find it difficult to say no to a financial arrangement that's being put forward to them by their son or their daughter. And that means that they might be less inclined to receive independent legal and financial advice, uh, particularly about the implications that um, using your home as security for a loan might have on their life. So some of those implications or risks are um, that the bank may sell the family home uh, in order to satisfy the debt if, if the loan falls into arrears. Um, it's very rare for clients to understand that their Centrelink pension payments may be reduced or cut off completely if the guarantee is called upon due to the effect of the gifting rules that, that Centrelink has. And, and finally, um, a significant implication is, that, is the emotional toll 
that the stress um, and stress that this may have on the family unit, it could cause a relationship breakdown between the parent and the child, which can be devastating for a parent, particularly in their old age. And you make some observations in your statement about the extent to which clients recall the circumstances in which they enter into guarantees. Could you just explain to the Commissioner what observations you've made about that? Mm. Uh, so my clients, um, so legal aid clients generally um, in these sorts of matters often have a limited recollection of the circumstances of signing up to the guarantee. Um, this might be because of their limited literacy skills uh, or other difficulties communicating. For example, they may have a disability or not speak English as a first language. But very often it's because their child has done most of the logistics um, and, and, and sorted out the, the paperwork um, with the bank or in some cases with a broker. Um, I've seen some cases where a broker has been involved as well as a bank. Um, and in those cases, my client very often um, can't describe the circumstances of signing up to the guarantee beyond going to the bank usually just one time uh, accompanied by the son or daughter who is receiving the benefit of the financial arrangement um, and they can't provide much more information beyond that. In fact, I've had cases before where clients think that they are a guarantor um, but they in fact are a co-borrower um, which comes with a, a different set of um, obligations on their part. Um, very often my clients haven't entered into complex financial arrangements like a mortgage and a guarantor before and don't understand what being a more, having a mortgage or being a, a guarantor um, involves before they come to legal aid and speak to a legal aid solicitor. Now, you've referred a couple of times to independent legal advice. We'll come to the detail of this case in a moment, but Presumably in some of the cases that come to you, there's a certificate that's been signed by a solicitor or a statutory declaration that's been given in the presence of a solicitor about the, the giving of independent legal advice? Yes, I have seen some cases like that. And do those cases also give rise to or have given reason <coughs> to issues in which you've been involved about the guarantee? Um, sorry, I don't quite understand Let me the put question. it a slightly different way. In terms of the understanding that clients have, have you made any observations about the extent to which their understanding has been assisted by receiving independent legal advice? Mm. I would say that nearly all of the cases that I have seen at Legal Aid, um, the, the client did not understand the detail of the financial arrangement that they were signing up to. Um, for example, they might not have understood the amount of the loan or the type of the loan, um, say a consumer law versus an investment or business loan, or they may not have been able to describe what it means to be a guarantor um, or have a mortgage. Um, so in the cases where there has been independent um, legal and financial advice, uh, I don't think that it has assisted people to understand um, what they're doing. Um, one case in particular that I'm recalling, the son or daughter was present at the time that that advice was given, the legal advice, and so there's real questions about whether it is independent in the first instance. Right. Now, when these types of cases are brought to you, presumably one possibility is that you might go to court and have a dispute in court. Is that a realistic practical outcome? Our, our first step is, is often to um, try to resolve the matter directly with um, the financial service provider or in the financial ombudsman service um, or the credit and investment ombudsman service. So to try to resolve the matter in external dispute resolution. And we've had a really great um, experience in, in that regard. The financial ombudsman service um, is a really professional and efficient way of resolving disputes in a fair and reasonable way for consumers. Um, but in some cases, the matter is um, more appropriate to go to court. Say it's um, complex legally, or there are a number of other parties that might be involved, such as the third party beneficiary, so the son or daughter, um, or a broker. And in those cases, it's more appropriate to go to court. Um, but court has difficulties, um, some difficulties, including that it can be a stressful 
place for people to resolve their legal disputes. It can be expensive, um, time consuming and legally complex. I want to now move from the general to the specific case that we're considering today, which is Ms Flanagan. And you first met Ms Flanagan in about June of 2014, is that That's right? That's correct. And I think she'd already by then spoken with another solicitor from Legal Aid? That's correct. Um, she had spoken with a solicitor, one of my colleagues at the Penrith Legal Aid office. She'd made an appointment or she'd popped into the Penrith office uh, to see a solicitor following receiving a statement of claim um, from, from the, the bank. All right. And during the meeting with Ms Flanagan, she explained to you her medical conditions? That's right. So during um, the first meeting that I had with, with Ms Flanagan and, and her support person, um, they explained to me um, some of her medical conditions following the treatment um, of, of cancer a few years earlier, which had affected her ability to speak. Uh, and also um, she had some difficulty seeing, she described it as, as near blindness, so really difficult to see objects in front of her, everything was blurry, not able to read and write easily. Um, and she also described to me that it was difficult for her to move around because of her osteoporosis. And I observed myself um, that Miss, Miss Flanagan's speech was quite restricted. She wasn't able to speak um, more than say a few sentences or, or a paragraph at a time without having a sip of water. Um, and she wasn't able to read or write. So in the course of assisting her, I made sure that I, I read everything to her that was necessary. Um, and I observed that her movement was quite restricted as well um, not being able to get around without the use of a, a cane or, or a walking frame. Was she able to sign documents? Uh, she was able to sign her name, um, but where I... She was able to do this when I indicated where she needed to sign uh, because she would say to me that she can't see the place where she's supposed to sign. And was she able to in a conversation with you, maintain eye contact with you? No, when I was speaking with her, she wasn't able to make eye contact with me. Right. Now, you obviously took instructions from her at the time and you've set out those instructions in your statement. Are you able to comment on what her recollection is like now as compared to what it was like then when you were dealing with her? At the time that I was dealing with Miss Flanagan, so some years ago now, her recollection was uh, more detailed than what it is now. And you decided to, what you advised Ms Flanagan to do is to bring a FOS complaint, is that right? That's correct. So um, my colleague in the Penrith office initially advised Ms Flanagan to make a FOS um, complaint. Uh, he gave her some advice about when the statement of claim, when the 28 days would lapse and was suggesting that it was important to make a financial ombudsman claim before that date. Um, I met with Miss Flanagan and her support person prior to the 28 days lapsing and assisted her to make a financial ombudsman service claim on the grounds of uh, financial hardship on that day. And there was subsequently in addition to the financial hardship complaint also an issue about effectively the lending decision whether a guarantee should have been taken in the first place is that right uh sorry can you was the the issue in question? front of FOS wasn't confined to financial hardship it was expanded out could you just explain what the expansion out was Yes, okay, that's correct. Um, when I first made the financial ombudsman claim in late June, it was on the grounds of financial hardship. And once I'd received more um, information, so some documents through the FOS process, uh, I gave some advice to Ms Flanagan about um, expanding her claim to include a, um, an unjust contracts claim in respect of the guarantee and also making a claim in respect of some of the banking code of practice um, obligations, some breaches in respect of those obligations. Right, and during the course of that FOS dispute, do, do you remember Westpac having produced the original version of the guarantee or mortgage? No. Okay. 
Um, so you haven't seen those before? No. All right. Now, the end result of that FOS pro... Oh, I'm sorry, I should go back a step. What you were seeking on behalf of Ms Flanagan through the FOS process was what result? Uh, her ultimate goal and our ultimate goal was for her to remain in her property for the rest of her lifetime. So it might be described as a life interest in her property. Um, and we were hoping to achieve that um, in a way that the bank would agree to not uh, enforce the guarantee until that, that time that Miss Flanagan passed away or she chose to sell her property. And during the course of the FOS process, you communicated that desire to the Ombudsman that you were dealing with? That's correct. And you understood that the Ombudsman had communicated that desire to Westpac? That's correct. And what was Westpac's position during the course of the FOS process as to whether that was a possible outcome? Uh, Westpac's position, which was communicated to me from FOS, was that it would not be a possible resolution to the dispute. I also had a conversation with a Westpac officer um, putting that proposal to him and he also said that it was an unlikely um, settlement. And the FOS process concluded then with a determination in favour of Westpac, is that That's right? That's correct. Right. And what happened after the FOS process? After the FOS process, um, my manager at the time uh, contacted another consumer advocate to ask if he had a um, senior contact at Westpac that we could escalate this matter to, um, given our client was facing homelessness in her old age and given her um, medical difficulties as well, it would have been very um, hard for her. Um, shortly after my colleague sent that email to the consumer advocate, the consumer advocate copied a number of Westpac Oh, sorry, one Westpac contact to that email. The Westpac contact then copied um, a couple of people from her team, I think it was the assist team at Westpac, to the email and asked <coughs> for more information. At that point, I um, sent a letter that I had drafted on behalf of Miss Flanagan, outlining her personal circumstances, including her medical circumstances, um, and asking for a life interest in her property as a settlement. Um, and within a, a day or two, Westpac had um, agreed to settle on those terms. That's, and I think you might have dealt with a particular person within Westpac from the collections hardship area, is that right? That's correct. And what that employee of Westpac expressed to you was surprise at the thought that Westpac would be evicting and it wasn't in line with what Westpac would normally do? Yes, that's correct. And she suggested that in future, if these sorts of situations arose, that it might be worth approaching her directly. Is that that's right? That's correct. All right. And there was then a, a deed that was drafted between you and Westpac, is that right? Yes, that's right. And the, the original deed, I think, I'm sorry, in the course of discussing the drafting of the deed, Westpac set out that the settlement figure that was required was 170,000 rather than 160,000, is that That's right? That's correct. And that reflected what they said were the extra costs that had been incurred after the, after the loan had been made? That's correct. And then the deed also provides that there'll be 3% interest accruing on that per annum? Yes. Okay. And that deed's now been signed up by both Westpac and Ms. And I'm sorry, by Ms. Flanagan, is that yes, right? Yes, that's right. All right. Commissioner, I have no further questions for Ms. McGuire. Yes, yes Mr. Dark. Thank you, Commissioner. Um, Ms. Baglari, my name's Matthew Dark. I'm a lawyer for Westpac. I don't just have a few questions for you. Um, when you were acting for Ms. Flanagan, do you recall obtaining uh, a file from a lawyer whose name appeared as uh, the witness on the guarantee and mortgage that she had executed? Yes, that's right. And 
Do you recall that that file contained a declaration signed by Ms Flanagan and witnessed by the solicitor? Yes. We might just have that brought up on the screen, if I may, Commissioner. The doc ID is um, WBC.407.001. Dot double zero five two, and that is exhibit DB two to um, Ms Bagliani's Bagliari's statement. Um, uh, and, and you recall that when you looked at that declaration, uh, Ms Bagliari, that you recognised that it stated that Ms Flanagan had received independent legal advice before signing the guarantee and mortgage. Yes, I understand that. That's the effect of the document. And um, for that reason, you regarded the declaration as being inconsistent with the instructions you had from Ms Flanagan that she never had received legal advice, is that, that right? That's correct. Um, when you saw the declaration, did you consider speaking to uh, the solicitor who had signed it in order to resolve the inconsistency between the declaration and what your instructions were? I did write to the solicitor asking for information about the file. And once I received that information, I didn't take any further steps to contact the solicitor. Yes, thank you. I have no further questions. Just, um, before you sit down, Mr. Dark, Ms. Pagliari, what do you understand paragraph two of that declaration to be telling you? Commissioner, the paragraph um, says that uh, the Ms Flanagan had received independent legal advice regarding the loan and security documents referred to in the above paragraph. It tells you nothing about the subject of the advice, does it? No, that's right. It doesn't tell you what the question is. It just says, I've been to a lawyer. That's correct. Yeah. Mr Dark? There's nothing arising out of that, Commissioner. No. Mr Hodge? Nothing further, Commissioner. Could Ms. Baglari be excused? Yes, thank you, Ms. Baglari. You are excused. Thank you.